Welcome everyone. So glad you're able to join us this morning for HDL's latest California statewide sales tax forecast webinar. Um, before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that this presentation will be recorded and along with the slide deck be made available on our website, hdlcompanies.com very soon. So feel free to check back on our website if you want to review the, the live presentation again or see the, uh, the actual documents and the slides that, uh, that we're going to be going through today. Also, as far as questions and answers, we, we will be at the very end reviewing any questions that have been submitted. Feel free to use the Q &A, uh, live Q&A box that is in the top right hand portion here on Microsoft Teams. So go ahead and click open that, uh, uh, that little sidebar there. Feel free to submit if you have any questions. We'll be happy to review as many as we can there at the end of the webinar. Also, for those of you who, uh, who recently have successfully completed your fiscal year 21-22 uh, annual budget cycle um, and have a council approved, officially a council approved budget. Congratulations. It's a huge monumental task every year. It takes a lot of communication, a lot of coordination, a lot of hard work, and it should absolutely be celebrated because here we are right at the beginning of that fiscal year, first day, July 1st. So um, <clears throat> as we have the last few quarters, both, uh, both myself, Bobby Young, client services director here at HDL, sales tax in California, and Brett Plumley, principal here at HDL Sales Tax California. We'll both be going through the, uh, the forecast as we have for you, kind of talk through all of the sectors and what we experienced and have been experiencing and what we see coming up. <clears throat> As a reminder, for those of you maybe not as familiar with, uh, with HDL companies, um, our clients include cities, counties, and special districts, including most certainly uh, transportation agencies uh, there on the special district side. We are blessed to have a 99% client retention rate, uh, so thankful for all of, your, all of you as clients uh, that we get to service. And as a part of the services that we provide, we'll be talking a lot about obviously sales tax and transactions use tax today and those trends. But just a reminder, we also have a property tax uh, uh, company, economic development, cannabis management, specifically tax and fee administration for certain revenue streams like business license, TOT, short-term rentals uh, revenue, utility users tax and franchise fees tax. So uh, kind of a wide range. We, uh, we try to serve as many as possible and give uh, uh, produce as much efficiency. So keep us in mind if any of these other services uh, maybe come up in conversation and you'd like a little bit more information, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to provide you uh, more information as, uh, as needed. So let's start talking about the forecast and uh, it doesn't uh, we don't lose sight of it too much or go too far uh, to have to be reminded or we should kind of remind ourselves of everything that's transpired this last year, especially at the federal level and what Congress specifically has done here on the screen. You'll see just four of the large, the very large uh, stimulus and relief packages that Congress has, has approved throughout the last year that have really been not so tangibly uh, or not so uh, specifically showing up in our data, but we know that it's there. And it's why we wanna provide kind of a reminder, as you'll see here on the next slide, <clears throat> that uh, that trickle down effect, and again, just a reminder of how that federal stimulus money has been, has been pushed out to uh, us as consumers, but then also back into inevitably our sales tax revenue generation. So, whether it be initially, we saw $600 a week unemployment pen, uh, payments that, uh, that were offered, later extended but reduced down to about $400 a week. Can't lose sight of that. We saw $1,200 per person, $500 per child direct cash payments that, uh, that definitely helped uh, the overall, and, uh, uh, overall <laughs> economy, but us as consumers. Mortgage forbearance for homeowners, uh, six months and even extended longer as needed. Also, as a subset of that, we saw rental relief provided, helping keep money in, in people's pockets and, and helping through this. 
By way of the last couple of stimulus packages, we saw an additional $600 per person. And then most recently, through the ARPA program, we saw $1,400 per person direct payments. And now those came with some income limits and uh, started to phase out at different points. But again, very important reminder of how much we've actually seen come down into our economy. Also, as a reminder, this is just a quick recap. Uh, we will be looking at first quarter 2021 data very quickly here. But just a reminder of the calendar year and, and how that transpired or compared to calendar year 2019 and regionally throughout the state. You can see those at the very top. San Joaquin, far north area, Sacramento region had a very positive change compared to uh, the pre-pandemic calendar year, if you will, 2019, where it was really then the Central Coast, Southern California as an entire region and the Bay Area experienced the biggest losses. So um, just kind of a reminder that the overall results statewide haven't, uh, haven't necessarily been the same uh, or had the same experience. And even as a note there under Southern California specifically, we have definitely seen within our data a dramatic difference between the counties of Los Angeles and Orange County <clears throat> compared to Riverside and San Bernardino. Uh, so it's uh, it's very uh, interesting and, and for us fascinating when we see the data, to see how it's different throughout the entire state. So let's get into the results here, starting in the, right the middle of the screen, the last black box, if you will, the first quarter 2021 period on a, uh, just think when you think first quarter, it's the January, February, March time period, the latest sales tax results that we have, you'll see a positive nine and a half percent gain. Uh, definitely kind of continuing our, uh, our enthusiasm and optimism overall with the results. And then you even as you kind of uh, look there to the uh, to the right, you'll see our forecast representing 2Q, 3Q and very dramatic percentages. And I think when we're looking at starting here in 1Q21, it's important to, to then look to the left. Far left, you'll see a year ago, 1Q20 was actually down 0.4%. That's uh, that's a time period there, January, February, March, right in the middle of March is when the shelter in place directive was set in and we saw a dramatic decrease out of all of our businesses, business closures, kind of a tightening of spending and everything else. <clears throat> now that's what we're going to start comparing to. So then when we uh, when we look at it and, and see that nine and a half percent gain while very positive, it is somewhat starting to be exaggerated because of what was going on a year ago that then will carry obviously these next three quarters as you're looking at the green bar areas in our forecast dramatic 30 percent gain expected as a part of 2q that'll be the april may june time period the months that just ended uh in real time you can look back a year ago down 16 percent so um, when we uh inevitably when we come out to all of our clients and start talking about uh, comparisons it, uh, it won't surprise us too much if, uh, if we do start seeing some very dramatic percentage changes. As with most of the slides coming up, you're gonna see down below in the line graph, the gray er grayed out area there is the last five quarters, the more of the black percentages that you see up above, and then the dotted line represents our forecast. <laughs> and overall on a statewide basis, even uh, the seasonality effect that we get what you can see as we start to move forward into fiscal year 21, 22, and we'll see it later in the um, in the presentation is we have experienced now a fairly strong recovery and no doubt, and it's why we, want, we wanted to talk about the reminder of the federal stimulus money, how much that's pumped back into our economy to not just sustain us, but as you'll see in some major categories, we've experienced continued growth uh, through the pandemic period. So. Uh, very positive results overall. Here, just kind of getting into some of the details, if you will, that very top line as you go across both the black and the, the green uh, bars there, that's what you just saw on the previous slide. So down below the, the green line is the same as before. The brown line and those percentages up above represent just local place of sale. And you can see how dramatically those were impacted. If you're looking across the percentages there on the left of the screen, um, 
local place of sale, local brick and mortars were definitely impacted very, very hard. And then the gap in between these two really represents the growth and continued expansion out of and allocations from the county and statewide use tax pools. So um, <clears throat> that uh, as you then shift across, as businesses start to reopen, this is kind of where we're getting here. Uh, as businesses start to reopen, we're going to see growth specifically at a local place of sale and probably a little bit of a diminished growth, uh, less than what we've seen uh, over the last few quarters, especially from the uh, from the pools. There's also a shifting dynamic that's happening. We're going to address that later in the presentation uh, that also is going to move those numbers, but it's just kind of to show we do anticipate local brick and mortar growing a little bit faster and helping keep these uh, the positive results going. At this point, I'm going to go ahead, I believe, and shift over to Brett to jump in, talk about autos. So, Brett. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate that. So, as Bobby is giving you an overview statewide of all the industry groups combined, we're now going to drill down, start talking about the various major industry groups, starting with autos and transportation. And autos and transportation, we've been talking to you for five quarters now since COVID began. And Bobby mentioned the basically one sixth of the first quarter of 20, the two weeks in March of 2020 when COVID first struck. And this industry has done primarily better than what we have forecast every single quarter, including the quarter that we're talking to you about now, the first quarter of 21. So this particular slide we're talking about registrations on the left we have the big increases in the quarter and on the right the the biggest decreases so what's happening with autos what we have is luxury suvs and pickups both gained market share in california and based on new vehicle registrations through the first quarter of the year we have seen a phenomenon where used car prices are higher than original sticker prices, and this is due to really a lack of supply and a rising new motor vehicle prices. So it's offsetting the, the demand is really significant now for used cars as well. The luxury brands that you can see there on the left are doing well, they're more expensive. And so as a result, the sales tax associated is going up significantly non-luxury brands that you see on the right are down pretty significantly in the quarter so offsetting the overall increases california new vehicle registrations are down or were down in the first quarter of 21 but the local sales tax revenue i'm going to talk about that in the next slide is up 20.4 percent in the first quarter and what are some of the reasons why and mainly i've talked about it it's supply is heavily restricted and that's leading to an upward pressure on the prices. And just in summary, more expensive brands are hot, plus supply restraints are forcing higher prices. And this is resulting in the large growth that we're seeing in that first quarter 21 in local tax receipts. So in the next one, we're gonna talk about the industry group as a whole. And first quarter 21 actual results more than 20 percent increase over the first quarter of 20 and we projected a five percent increase so really significantly higher than the projection and, and very good news especially for your agencies those agencies that have a high amount of autos and transportation a high percentage our forecast anticipates continued strong results from this group finishing fiscal year 2021 up 14 and a half percent and growth slowing in fiscal year 21, 22, and then following that by a flat year after that as demand settles down and the market resets. Our long-term forecast that we have out to fiscal year 25, 26 is projecting 3% annual growth. So still solid growth as we move forward in this industry. The next one is building and construction and this particular industry group along with food and drugs that I'll talk about in a moment stabilized the quickest during COVID really got back to fiscal year 1819 levels early on back in 1920 and first quarter 21 has continued that pattern the actual results were 12 percent higher than first quarter of 20 
and we had projected a four and a half percent increase. The group largely, the gains are from building materials that we've been talking with you about and home improvement stores. Commodity prices have soared. Lumber prices are up over 400 percent. They now have recently come down somewhat, pretty significantly back down, but still up much higher than they were pre-COVID. Both major home improvement retailers have reported increased contractor activity, and this is compared to do-it-yourself spending, but expect demand to remain strong as the project backlogs get completed. Spending continues to be focused around the do-it-yourself projects that we have been talking about all five quarters now during COVID. Nesting impacts are evident and that has been heightened by the pandemic's impact. Contractor activity also has remained in line with expectations. Residential permit values have remained elevated. They're up over 20% through April 2021 as California continues to battle with a short supply of housing units. This segment is expected to have continued growth through fiscal year 21-22. We are expecting some pullback on the extended horizon. Prices will stabilize. Households will complete projects that they've been putting off. There, we are projecting long-term growth out to fiscal year 25-26 annually of 5%, which is good news for this industry. Fiscal year 21-22, we have built in a 5.4% increase into the forecast. The next one is food and drugs. I mentioned stability in this industry. We've been talking about that with you four quarters in a row during COVID. And again, the results in the first quarter are showing that this is stable, this particular industry, pretty flat in the first quarter of 21. We had projected a 1%, we had anticipated flattening out, and the actual results were down a little bit, down about 0.7%. This group has provided resiliency, and as a result, we have seen that small dip, that 0.7% from the prior year, and we have softened our outlook now compared to where we were last quarter for this particular sector as we go forward. First quarter 21, the business type convenience stores and then cannabis related businesses were up. And this was offset by grocery stores that were down and offset the overall gains. Fiscal year 21, 22, we have projected a 1.7% growth. And long term, we are projecting pretty much continued stability, but 2% growth all the way out to fiscal year 25, 26. And then fuel and service stations, this industry, along with the restaurants and hotels, which I'll talk about in a moment, have really been hit the hardest. All four quarters and now five quarters during COVID significantly negatively impacted. And we had forecast a 5% drop in the first quarter of 21 in fuel and service stations. Our forecast was very close to what actually came in. The receipts were down 5.8%. And the quarter that we're now entering into third quarter, the last quarter that was just completed, second quarter 21, everything is pointing to upward pressure on sales tax in this industry. The vaccination rollout has been successful. We're seeing gradual recovery in the global economy. Oil barrel prices are up significantly and projected into the mid $70 range. They're actually there right now, but by the end of this summer, 2021, that we just entered into. Prices at the pump are higher now than they were at the peak level, fourth quarter 19, which is prior to COVID. The average price of a gallon of gasoline now is $4.15, and that compares to $4.03 at the end of fourth quarter 19. So upward pressure on demand. Demand for fuel is significantly up throughout Europe and in California. The travel industry, as you see airline travel picking up significantly with the vaccinations being rolled out. And this also has a positive push on sales tax. Jet fuel is included in this sector. Jet fuel is up the price at the same level a little bit 
lower than it was pre-COVID, but almost all the way back up to pre-COVID levels. So upward pressure ongoing and 2% is the forecast all the way out to fiscal year 25, 26. And then the restaurants and hotels sector, this first quarter 21 results were actually a little bit worse than what we had projected. We had continued to project a downward pressure all four quarters and now the fifth quarter in a row since COVID began. We projected 11% the actual results statewide down almost 16%. And this is primarily attributable to casual dining. The biggest percentage business type in this sector continued to be restricted in the first period, the first quarter of 21. And that being said, this segment is poised for really significant bounce back as capacity restrictions. They were lifted June 15th. You're now seeing evidence of that with restaurants being crowded and the social distancing being lifted inside of the restaurants. No masks are required and the tables are beginning to be filled back up again. The expected summer surge related to the pent up demand, everyone wanting to get back out and combining this with an increase in menu prices should lift the taxable receipts in the near term. What we're finding and we're talking to employers and they're having difficulty hiring employees, that's been a struggle with some restaurants and that's limiting their operations. And we can, Bobby talked about the, the various federal stimulus dollars that are out there and we can expect a bump from American Rescue Plan, it's $28 billion earmarked for restaurants. We're still somewhat cautious about campus and office parks reopening and the impact that those facilities will have on the overall sector at this point, the timing is unknown. And as I mentioned in airline travel and the impact that that has on fuel and service stations, domestic travel picking back up and recovering has a positive impact on this sector as well. Fiscal year 21-22, we're anticipating a statewide increase 26.1%. So really healthy rebound, especially in the second quarter of 21 that Bobby talked about this rebound happening and especially in comparison to second quarter 20 when we had the COVID restrictions, the shelter in place and everything shut down. So 21, 22 up significantly and then stability in the industry Annual increases projected 4% all the way out to fiscal year 25, 26. And as we do, and just a reminder, we fine tune our forecast to your individual agency, that this is statewide information and forecast that we are giving you today. And now I'll hand it back over to Bobby, to talk about general consumer goods. Great, thank you, Brett. <clears throat> Um, so another category that uh, has been was largely impacted by the pandemic, as uh, as we talk about, you know, uh, shelter in place and the store closures. You can see here general consumer goods right in the middle of the line graph in the shaded area. How deep those cuts really ran, and it definitely gives us perspective now to be able to see that uh, with these most recent um, quarters in the activity. Unlike you heard Brett talk about with fuel service stations and restaurants, what we saw out of 1Q21 for general consumer goods, you see it right in the middle of the screen and the percentage increase for 1Q21 of 10% gain. And again, now we're comparing to the 1Q20 period that was so dramatically impacted, 11% drop. Um, whether it be uh, you know here in 1Q21, and there's always this seasonal effect. Uh, this is a category that is largely impacted or um, you know, swings, if you will, because of the normal fourth quarter holiday shopping period, you can see the 1Q uh, drop off is fairly normal. We, we're not surprised by that, but the 10% uh, the gain over the prior year, definitely um, you know, right there as far as giving us hope and optimism for what the summer is to come. Again, much like what you heard out of uh, fuel and service stations and restaurants, we are anticipating solid growth all the way through the end of the calendar year and then even continuing into what will be inevitably the calendar year 22, you know, uh, calendar year two, uh, 2022. So a lot of hope here as businesses continue to reopen, consumers uh, maybe while buying online was um, 
the uh, demand, it was a necessity. Uh, now the option to, to go back in and have a normal shopping experience, maybe go back to our malls, um, you know, see some, some some summer tourism and thereby spending during the, the second quarter, third quarter, even the holiday period you'll see there for fourth quarter 21, we're projecting 11% gain. On the next slide, we'll just kind of break down because this is a very large category, a lot of different businesses and business types. And here on the screen, uh, comparing the first quarter period over the last three years. So first quarter 2019 in the green, first quarter 20, again, the most impacted, if you will, or the starting of the impacts from the pandemic there in yellow, and now most recently with 1Q21 in the blue. Uh, department stores fell off and uh, some in the industry and, and even those as, uh, as far as economic development, you might say department stores are going to continue to be impacted. Uh, we'll continue to watch that very closely, but right next to it, the largest sector overall within general consumer goods, discount department stores. Uh, think very big, very big, large box retailers here um, only have been experiencing growth here in the first quarter over the last three years uh, to two year comparison periods. So uh, that's a trend probably not going to fall off as that volume shopping um, that uh, that most in our communities are getting are used to. You can't really do that online and, and that really, I think, ex uh, accentuate, accentuated the growth during the pandemic. Other categories, smaller in scale, electronic appliance stores not yet coming coming back. Probably will take to the summer period as malls reopen and, and get back uh, uh, in person. Those will come around. Family apparel has experienced a uh, a bit more of a rebound. Uh, I think discount or not the department store apparel here, um, showing some good signs of uh, of coming back here in the one Q period. Home furnishings, much like what you, the trickle over effect, if you will, from the building uh, results that uh, that we've been experiencing. Homeowners having equity, being able to put that back into their house, funneling over here to the home furnishing side, showing positive growth here out of the one Q period. Specialty stores, again, very wide and dynamic as they reopen. We will anticipate those to uh, to continue to see growth. So, uh, so just kind of given some overall dynamics. Also here on this slide, want to give specific credit. You see down below the source here, U.S. Bureau of Economic Analyst and UCLA Anderson forecast. This was something that uh, we had noticed as we attended their forecast. Um, give some perspective again. Uh, this is on a statewide basis, all consumer spending. The top line there focused on services and normally non-taxable services, you can see how dramatically that spending had dropped off and UCLA's forecast for services to rebound. <clears throat> Where is that gonna come from? And you see that down below, all, all goods, and it does play into our forecast when we talk about autos and building and um, uh, here on general consumer goods. You could see that increase that has happened and, and did happen during the pandemic trailing back off just a little bit and uh, getting down into maybe more of a historical growth uh, uh, trend. But uh, this was one that really caught our eye. We wanted to go ahead and, uh, and provide it to you guys as well. And again, credit to UCLA Anderson Forecast for, uh, for putting this together. So let's talk about two other major groups that are experiencing a, um, a little bit of a zero sum game, but a dynamic shift in between. Um, you'll see here the top line, the, the green line, state and countywide use tax pools and the growth obviously that they've been experiencing. Think online sales activity uh, coming from out of state there. And then business and industry, a category for us that uh, is also very dynamic and, and includes a lot of different sectors. But as we'll be talking about here very shortly, also includes fulfillment centers where the local Bradley Burns gets allocated to the jurisdiction where a physical fulfillment center is located. The uh, some of the, the reference points here, if you will, there is normally again on the green line, the use tax pools, there has normally been the seasonal drop off when we hit one queue, especially compared to the fourth quarter normal holiday shopping period. 
So again, doesn't take us by too much surprise there that that uh, that top line has decreased uh, compared to and the dramatic rise that you've seen over these last few uh, few quarters specifically. Keep in mind that we had AB 147 and new regulations on out of state online retailers that tax that new tax revenue got funneled back into uh, your local jurisdictions by way of the state, uh, the countywide use tax pools. So that has really accentuated that green line up these last few quarters. The point that we're going to be talking about here is the 1Q21 period did see maybe a little bit more of a drop off than uh, than has been the the historical norm, but BNI as a category didn't experience quite the same drop off here in the 1Q period, and it's specifically related to uh, some retailers starting to change their reporting uh, compared to historical periods and now shifting revenues away from the countywide use tax pools into local distributions. So let's go ahead and uh, focus on that these uh, these next couple of slides and um, maybe just give reminders of how uh, sales and use tax gets allocated here specifically. Let's take, let's talk sales tax and as many of us know it applies when goods are goods that are located in California at the time of the sale. Tax dollars get uh, get allocated locally, and you can see then that uh, the stock includes goods that are held in a California warehouse or a fulfillment center, or as most of us know, in the retail store themselves when we go in and buy it. So that's all sales tax. And then as we compare that to the use tax component here, you'll see really be thinking out of state retailers shipping goods uh, from out of state into California. Here, the use tax applies when title of the goods patch passes to the purchaser at a point outside of California. Um, so goods, again, are normally just shipped in if, uh, if we have retailers who uh, are located outside of California. So taking that down one, uh, one level into more specifically, so here on the left, you'll see sales tax really think place of sale where the sale order was placed or negotiated or the goods um, exchanged over the counter. Uh, the local Bradley Burns gets allocated directly to the local jurisdiction where that transaction takes place. Third bullet point there on the left is probably uh, one of the more important ones. If an out-of-state retailer does not have a permanent place of business, then, uh, then the local tax will be distributed where the inventory is located at the time of sale. So that's kind of a, a big one that we'll be talking about here. Use tax there on the right, think place of use. Um, goods that are coming from out of state, again. Um, wherever the county, the county in which those goods were shipped, that becomes the countywide use tax pool that the local dollars go into and uh, then get distributed out uh, on a pro rata basis to every city within that county. So use tax generally allocated via the use tax pool. The big shift, and this gives the visual, if you will, uh, we have had um, retailers who, uh, as you'll see here, if I can click one time for me, there you go. Uh, retailers that are not in store, you'll see the very top there, online, out of state. Uh, retailers that don't technically own their fulfillment centers or, or warehouses here in California, you can see how that trickles down directly. All that sales tax revenue gets allocated to the countywide use tax pool wherever those goods were shipped. The big change that we have, if you will, is going to be that we have retailers now who have taken ownership of those fulfillment centers, so no longer owned by a third party, and so their local tax is actually going to split. And you can see how it now comes. Some of those goods are at, and you'll see there are noted on the left, location of goods at time of sale. Some of those goods are still going to be coming from out of state, not stored in California. And by way of this flow chart, you could still, that local tax dollar will still go into the countywide use tax pool. But the bigger change is we now have some of that revenue that um, will be, uh, following the goods, some of those goods being stored in a California fulfillment center. As you can see, that will trickle down. The local tax will get allocated directly to the jurisdiction where the fulfillment center is located. We have had retailers um, in the past who have you know, operated under um, 
each one of these and uh, for different reasons, business reasons of their own, uh, what we saw this quarter was a bigger shift in the uh, in the revenue uh, from the countywide use tax pools to the local jurisdictions. And so on the next slide, when we're talking about specifically business and industry, again, a category that includes fulfillment centers, which is on the next slide, but uh, we'll stay here for a sec. You'll see one Q21 period growing by 19%. Very dramatic, especially as you look to the left and see the most recent performance for the group through the pandemic. Uh, very strong gains, and it's because of that reporting shift and money coming out of the pools being shifted over uh, to the uh, local fulfillment center, the local jurisdiction that uh, where the fulfillment centers are located, that's going to then move these percentages. And you can see over the next three quarters coming up, again, very uh, solid, uh, you know, positive results expected, 18%, 19% because of this reporting change. Once we get past this fourth quarter, four quarter period of the change, we then start to compare to prior year. And you can see as we go out and really talking about internet sales uh, as a subset of this, we do anticipate continued solid growth, four and 5% uh, going out. Um, some uh, some consumers have changed their, their habits. And so online sales not expected to drop off dramatically and uh, and thereby not, not really impact the business industry category. So let's go to the next slide where we uh, focus specifically on these percentage changes for fulfillment centers as a category overall subset of business and industry. You can see the most recent percentages and, and some notes there on the right side. Just a reminder, AB 147 and the collection of uh, the requirements and the collection of uh, new tax revenue from out-of-state online retailers and specifically marketplace facilitators as a part of that. You'll see um, right when it went into effect, especially the marketplace facilitator aspect, we saw 42% growth out of fourth quarter 2019, 65%. And then as the pandemic hit, uh, we saw fulfillment center generation increase dramatically over 100%, almost 150 there in 2Q, 106 in 3Q. Uh, st still strong growth out of fourth quarter, 48%. But now with this reporting change, we see it jump up. 163 percent all right and again anticipating that to uh to uh, continue these next three quarters uh to finish off the reporting change and, and the comparison others uh major categories and such some trends that uh, that we've noticed within um, some uh, other business types within bni you see the top line there medical and biotech should not surprise any of us when we're talking about the pandemic and whether it be pp and e uh, equipment um, uh, everything related to, <laughs> to support uh, through the pandemic you can see how much medical biotech has jumped uh, probably will continue as we uh, as we move forward these uh, these next couple of quarters on that industry. Others and and uh, the three others there: light industrial, heavy industrial, and office equipment. You can kind of see comparison to 2018 and 2019. These weren't really strong growth periods before the pandemic for these sectors, and even through the pandemic, have uh, tailed off just a little bit. Probably the uh, we'll see the rebound come with um, like with the PPP loans. Um, and a maybe a little bit more positive outlook on the economy. We'll see more businesses investing in uh, in equipment, starting to pop up a couple of these categories. See a return to office from uh, remote workers. Probably see office equipment take a nice little bump up. <clears throat> so just a few there that uh, that we're watching. But one very dramatic one down at the bottom uh, in the lavender color, warehouse farm construction equipment. You can see there's a little bit of a seasonal effect. Uh, tends to peak out during third quarter, fourth quarter. That business investment, no doubt, really showing up here in the fourth quarter. Um, uh, investing in things like tractors and, and heavy equipment that uh, we really saw that jump up. Good sign overall, even though we're coming up on a, a summer period, maybe a little bit more drought related and uh, going to be challenging for those uh, for the farm industry. Uh, we did ha we did see positive results there in 4Q and even in 1Q compared to the prior year. 
So let's talk about the pools because this is the other half of that uh, reporting shift. Uh, again, as you note, when the fourth quarter 2019 there, the uh, start of marketplace facilitator requirements, see strong 25% growth with that new tax revenue, continuing all the way through and increasing uh, through the pandemic periods. Uh, getting back down a little bit lower, but still st super strong out of uh, fourth quarter 2020. Now with the reporting change reflected as a part of 1Q, still saw solid 18% growth out of our county pools. Um, many things dumping in there and depends on your specific county, which we'll be happy to go over uh, with you during our meetings, but uh, still strong growth overall out of uh, online retailers and um, and others contributing into the uh, into the county pools. Um, and I think on the next slide is where we have our forecast here. Again, because of that reporting change, obviously there on the top left, you'll see percentages that are uh, dramatic like we just saw on the prior slide. Even as you then look and glance to the right on the percentages, you'll see still really strong expected growth going outward. We do have to go through this reporting change uh, period, but not anticipating uh, specifically online sales to uh, to decrease. Um, goods are getting more expensive, and that kind of applies overall to uh, sales tax revenue generation. But increased cost of goods will also increase sales tax revenue. So as we pay more, will uh, more will be generated. So good, uh, still good positive outlook from uh, from the county pools overall. So now as we compare to uh, taking again that statewide look, but shifting it for the majority of you who are on a uh, maybe more traditional uh, fiscal year outlook, um, July to June period, you can see how we compared to the prior years. And it's probably more tangible in the percentages where you'll see statewide really Fiscal year 1920 was the only decrease impacts uh, that were felt by the pandemic. As we turn the page and are uh, right here at the end, uh, just finished yesterday, at the end of fiscal year 2021, you can see we are anticipating a positive 8.5% statewide. That continuing, and hopefully we've we've given you a lot of depth with regards to categories like fuel and service stations, restaurants, uh, growth in online spending continuing, um, the rebound of brick and mortar general consumer goods. Fiscal year 21-22 should remain fairly solid at 9.5% growth. Our outlook overall as we go from there is probably maybe then a little bit more of traditional, you know, annualized growth, if you will, somewhere between three and four percent. Not yet really willing to anticipate a recession or a slowdown in those out years. Um, obviously, we'll be tracking and trending what's going on with the Fed and interest rates and how that might then transpire into consumer spending uh, affected one way or another. Um, but for now, we're uh, kind of figuring as we come and fully reopen, there'll be some stabilization period given the uh, the dramatic changes and uh, everything that we've experienced this last year. So next slide is a uh, comparison again, a little higher level here, just uh, comparing um, the, you know, the, a total four year period, the fiscal years that we've already experienced of 18, 19 and 19, 20, and then our forecasted periods of 21, 2021 and 21, 22. Uh, you could see the pools, especially because of AB 147, and no drop off, just continued growth um, all the way through, especially compared to the 1819 period. Other categories where we've seen that same dynamic, so here we'll kind of bounce around just a little bit. Down below, uh, business and industry, again with fulfillment centers as a subset there, um, <clears throat> you could see continued growth in comparison, way above 1819. Autos and transportation, as Brett has mentioned, was a facet has been a fascinating category for us to watch. Peeled off for fiscal year 1920, but has rebounded very strongly um, and likely to continue here in the short run. Building and construction, also a little bit lower on the list, but uh, strong growth uh, when comparing to the pre-pandemic period. Then those categories like general consumer goods, you can see getting back to where uh, where we were in 1819 by fiscal year, by the end of fiscal year 21 22 so still about a year to go there and then restaurants 
about midway through and fuel and service stations down below, even as Brett had mentioned, even by fiscal year 21, 22, not fully rebounded yet. Going to take a little bit longer past this period to uh, to get uh, to uh, back to where we were in 1819 uh, via our forecast. So some final thoughts and takeaways, if you will. Um, obviously, we all know that uh, the pandemic period and shelter in place directive impacted the entire state impacted the entire state a little differently, depending on your region, but everybody was impacted. Federal government has pumped trillions of dollars into our economy to the benefit uh, both of for us as consumers, but then also uh, for your local government because results definitely have not been as bad as what we were projecting even a year ago in the middle of the pandemic. Not, uh, very uncertain what, uh, what would be held, but we have seen more positive results. Uh, inland and suburban areas have fared a little bit better than the metropolitan areas, especially LA Orange County here in Southern California or the Bay Area uh, there in Northern California. And this shifting of local Bradley Burns uh, revenue from the pools to local jurisdictions, uh, specific note here that it will also inevitably impact how Prop 172 allocations are determined by, by way of the pro rata factor and then distributed and also the quarter cent local transportation funding, the quarter cent of the base sales tax rate, how those revenues will be allocated out um, will shift with this, uh, the shift of local Bradley Burns. So something that uh, we're gonna continue to watch and inform all of our clients of, and uh, really be able to, we hope, build into future forecasts as we go, as we go forward from here. Overall, our outlook has remained uh, fairly positive and a little bit more optimistic, especially if uh, you recall a year ago, uh, we, uh, we had more of a pessimistic <laughs> uh, feeling to ourselves. So we, uh, we do sit here a little bit more with smiles now, uh, which is probably a little bit more our speed and our comfortability. So hopefully, again, with uh, your local budget process and some of the forecasts that we provided you, hopefully um, that better, more optimistic outlook uh, was able to help weather uh, weather the process and make it a little easier. Um, always having its challenges, as we know. So at this point, we'll jump into the question and answer period. And hopefully, for those of you that uh, have been submitting, we'll go ahead and we I think we've already started to answer a few of those questions via the chat. So feel free to look there. And now we'll kind of look at and address other specifics. Uh, one that I'll publish right now is can the recording be, um, uh, let's see, where was it? <clears throat> oh, be sent to attendees. Please continue to watch our website, hdlcompanies.com. We'll be posting uh, a copy of this recorded presentation and the slides that we just went through on our website. So feel free to, uh, to, uh, to keep looking there probably about the next week. We got the holiday weekend coming up. Uh, so probably by mid next week, it should be uh, should be made available. Um, another one here, let me go ahead and uh, publish this and then we'll address it. So you can see here, got a question from Rich Lee. I recall that former Governor Brown banned sales tax rebate agreements between businesses and local municipalities about four to five years ago. However, I understand that there are loopholes around the law. Uh, is there any discussion of legislative efforts to address the legal loopholes? Um, as I recall, it wasn't a complete ban on sales tax rebate agreements. It was actually just a requirement that if your agency is going to sign a, a sales tax rebate agreement, that it be become public, which many of the rebate agreements uh, prior to that didn't need to be made uh, uh, available before meetings or before nego uh, as negotiations were taking place. And even as a subset of that requirement, if revenue is gonna be um, uh, changed from one local jurisdiction directly to another, then, um, sorry, my light just went out, um, that uh, you uh, you need, that other jurisdiction needed to be notified. So uh, um, I don't think that the, the law explicitly uh, banned them, but uh, is there legislative efforts to address the legal loopholes? It's, uh, it has been a continuation, uh, continuation of a thought and, um, uh, some jurisdictions wanting to 
make those changes. I can tell you, as we've continued to watch it uh, from a legislative process, it hasn't gained a whole lot of steam, a whole lot of efforts. Um, and it's there's lobbyists on both sides, but uh, there will no doubt be continued efforts. It, uh, it really comes down to uh, our state legislature and what their willingness to address the uh, the potential change, what their uh, uh, what their appetite is for that. But uh, for all of our clients, we continue to watch all legislative bills and we'll be updating you as we see progress, uh, if any is made on that front. And Bobby, there's one question on, is there any forecast on the increase or decrease of discretionary income statewide? And and we take that into account in terms of doing our overall forecast. We do our forecast at the state level and then we fine tune it for each of the seven major industry groups in the pool. But we do take information like discretionary income, the impact of the federal stimulus dollars, the job employment, global macroeconomic issues are definitely taken into account in our overall forecast. Yeah, and it's so it is indirectly included. I think uh, why we've been so surprised over these last uh, few quarters and why we wanted to kind of remind everybody of the amount of federal stimulus is we we weren't quite sure what consumers would do with that money. Um, we weren't so optimistic to think that they would have spent it all um, and thereby see these you know increases in online sales, especially out of autos. So. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's tough to really count on that and build it in. And um, for most of us, especially former government employees, even yourselves as government employees and, and over uh, the finances, OK, let's lean on the side of being conservative until we actually see some data. I think that's really our point here is to, to let everybody know we've seen the data. We, uh, we could see the results, the growth uh, or the uh, beginnings of the rebound at a 3Q and 4Q and now at a 1Q continuing to note that, yeah, it's in there. Um, I can't show it dramatically and, and so tangibly, but it is definitely in there. And um, also on that front, um, you know, as we talked about the, the federal stimulus money, uh, you know, later in the year out of the greater economics and the, the educational economic community, if they look back on this period and say we've gone through a very sharp V-shaped recovery, I don't think it'll be as much of a surprise for any of us and especially as we've gone through and see the, the trend um, and uh, and the growth, you go, yeah, that, that sounds about right. You know, overall from a statewide perspective, we saw one year dip where we actually saw three to four year dip out of the uh, the great recessionary period. So much different and um, probably feels a little bit more like a strong V-shaped recovery. Yeah, Bobby, there's a question that asks about um, where do we see cities and overall recovery at this point in time? And and uh, just to dovetail on what you're talking about here, that we it has been a, a dip, initial dip that came about because of COVID. COVID impacted the economy negatively, especially in those cities that have a significant tourism impact. They were hit really hard, but it's also been a recovery that is happening more quickly than what we had originally anticipated. So we're forecasting statewide. You know, we do have a statewide increase forecast in fiscal year 21-22, a little bit more than 8%, which is um, a pretty decent financial picture. And then it's going to be fine-tuned to your individual agency when we do that forecast. What in particular industry is the most important? What's the biggest percentage of your overall budget that's generated in each of the major industry groups? And we analyze it that way and fine-tune your individual forecasts. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, let's look. I'm going to publish a few of the uh, questions first, and then uh, we'll talk about them. A couple of them specifically um, reference Amazon and an Amazon fulfillment center and an Amazon last mile facility. Uh, it's a major uh, discussion point. Keep in mind as we talk about Amazon, they are a single taxpayer and we'll need to talk about them in a non-confidential sense. No dollar amounts given, uh, really trying to be sensitive, although we know that um, yes, their reporting changes have uh, uh, are a part of the shift that uh, that is happening 
So um, want to uh, let me see if I can kind of go through and, and publish these and I'll tack them one by one. <laughs> OK, so in the published area, then down at the bottom. Um, one question from Adam, does a last mile delivery center qualify as a fulfillment center? The um, it's why we talked about it during the presentation. Really keep in mind here what's going to dictate the local tax dollars being allocated will be the place of the goods at the time of sale. So for your last mile delivery center, if those if if that center is probably maybe a little bit more in the um, 100,000 square foot range, it's probably a facility where goods come in overnight and get put onto trucks and they're right out the door. Those goods have already been bought and they were located somewhere else, whether it be out of state or whether it be at a larger fulfillment center. Um, probably your last mile facility, depending on maybe most notably size, may not generate uh, local tax dollars, uh, the local Bradley Burns allocation. So uh, it is a dynamic we're going to continue to watch. Uh, we do have quite a bit of data and uh, reference points. So we'll continue to monitor it. Have, we're happy to have conversations with our clients individually in the meetings, especially if you're hearing about a, a new potential distribution center slash fulfillment center. Uh, we're happy to kind of walk through all of those possibilities uh, with you within, the, within our uh, normal quarterly meetings or even emails in specific situations rather than, uh, rather than here. Uh, another one, could you provide an example of what the impact is on the pools if your neighboring city has an Amazon fulfillment center or another internet fulfillment center uh, that's going to end up generating more local Bradley Burns uh, tax distributions? <clears throat> Happy to uh, have those conversations with you individually because it will be very countywide specific. Um, not quite the same, maybe even in Southern California versus Northern California, and which cities are in which counties. There is, though, when we talk about a shift in reporting, if but more local tax revenue goes specifically to a jurisdiction, inevitably they will likely get more of the countywide use tax pool on a percentage because remember it's every quarter it's calculated on a pro rata basis so as they possibly get a little bit more of the pool other cities within the county will get a little less and that's the dynamic um, while easy to explain uh, at this level, very uh, uh, agency uh, dependent and very agency specific. So we're happy to, within our quarterly meetings um, coming up, be happy to walk through all the changes with you and um, and talk through what you what you may need to uh, to help see the this change. Um, how, uh, let's see, another one by Anonymous1057. Has Amazon's tax structure shift been reflected in any of the latest data? It is reflected um, as a part of what you saw in the quarter, in the first quarter 2021 period. Um, major industry groups, there were some other changes that uh, are funneled in there. Obviously, there's dramatic growth in, uh, in different sectors, but uh, Amazon's reporting change has. Um, uh, now started here in 1Q21, and to our knowledge, they will also, um, uh, we're working with CDTFA fourth quarter 2020, may also receive some changes on a retroactive basis. So more to come uh, on uh, kind of the retro changes uh, for the past period. And I think that's the other one there. So coming up on the list a little bit, um, our Prop 172 and transportation funds uh, shifts due to cities with distribution centers enjoying a greater pro rata share of the pools. Yes, so Prop 172 and transportation funding use the local Bradley Burns allocations as the baseline for how those funding sources get allocated. Wherever retailers are allocating the local Bradley Burns, they also allocate the transportation funding. When it comes to Prop 172 and the, the bucket of money there, um, what, uh, what ends up happening is every calendar year, whatever the results are and however much is generated in the 58 different counties throughout the state, that whole calendar year's worth of activity, that's what dictates how much gets allocated in a future, uh, future period. 
And again, we're happy to, within the body of our meetings, talk through it with you. But as some jurisdictions get more local tax distribution, uh, kind of peeling away from other counties uh, by way of the countywide use tax pool, we do anticipate that Prop 172 will also start to shift in future periods. And um, by way of the timing, probably won't see those changes actually impact Prop 172 until fiscal year 22-23. There will be a timing delay um, that, uh, again, we're happy to take more time in our meetings to talk with you, but it uh, the impacts won't be as uh, immediate as what we've just seen out of Bradley Burns. Um, let's see. That is about all of them. Uh, this, uh, there's a few more new ones. So let me uh, let me see here. There are some more specific questions. You touched upon it, Bobby, in terms of we're happy to meet with the agencies individually to talk about the shift in tax structure and fulfillment centers. There's a couple of very specific Amazon related questions to the change in tax structure. Um, Long-term fulfillment center tax structure changes are incorporated into the forecast, but specifically we will talk to you when we meet with you individually for uh, any specific changes happening in your agencies. So a few, uh, few last questions here. Daniela Garcia uh, said, could you give us a little insight into how future monetary fiscal policy at the Fed level may impact sales tax revenue and consumer spending? Um, yeah, this one's a very interesting as we kind of think through the process, right? If we're, uh, if we're talking about monetary policy, the potential for the Fed Treasury to increase interest rates is probably the most uh, tangible change that uh, that could uh, be considered, right? Um, with that, we uh, if we run that scenario through, we're likely to see then uh, cost of goods get a little bit more expensive. Obviously, home loans, mortgage rates go up, uh, thereby decreasing slightly the uh, maybe the activity that's been happening and the growth out of property values. And that then trickles over into many for many consumers their home equity their home equity loans their home equity available that no doubt they've been tapping into with uh, the low interest rate environment that we've been experiencing over the last you know, three years four years um, a lot of that equity has started to be tapped into and be then spent and help us on the sales tax revenue generation side so as interest rates increase consumers may be squeezed a little bit to figure out where they're how much money do they have and uh, where is it going to be spent? The uh, the interesting point as a subset of that then becomes, OK, do goods get more expensive? You heard Brett talk about uh, restaurants and the cost per plate going up. That means more potential sales tax generation available. Cost of cars are going up and it's likely then kind of that underline as Brett talked about the auto industry pricing going up. If the same number of cars get bought, that means a higher sales tax generation. So um, I say that because it's still a little 50-50, right? If, uh, if the feds do increase interest rates, but they do it slowly, there may be some advantages overall to the economy and, stay, and keep sales tax uh, stabilized. If they go up too far, too fast, I think we can all then anticipate, yep, it's gonna hurt the economy. Uh, consumers will pull back a little bit um, not what we were thinking a year ago with the pandemic, but uh, sales tax revenue then may uh, growth may slow down a little bit. Uh, so hopefully that adds some context because it is, while maybe a little simple question, <laughs> um, it uh, it has very complex and multifaceted answers uh, to that. And Chuck Maurer has uh, has asked how should inflation be framed within this increase in demand. That too, right? The greater economics of uh, cost of goods getting more expensive and the inflationary uh, impacts on uh, the taxable good sales price. Um, it's tough to tell right now, uh, especially post pandemic, because we've seen the Fed pump in all this economy, all this money into our economy. I don't think that there's a clear picture on, um, you know, inflation or what the results will be when we're thinking or when we're looking back at data to know how it's gonna how it's gonna transpire 
So um, probably more to come there as uh, a lot of that money starts to um, be directed probably a little bit more onto infrastructure as we're hearing right now at the uh, at the federal level and more specific uses not directed back to consumers. Um, consumers go back to work, uh, less remote work, more in uh, in office work. How's that going to start to change um, the demand side overall? Um, so more to I think more to come. That's a great question. There's just uh, a whole lot more there. And do you foresee a weakening of the economy in the next couple of years if pressure on long term rates continue and factors such as ending of eviction and foreclosure memor memorandums and ending of extended benefits hit the economy? Um, yeah, it's um, again. Tough to tell because if you just landed on um, that what was framed there in the question, you go, yeah, there's probably going to be some downward pressure, except for again what you may have heard out of Brett. Um, on the restaurant side where it's very difficult right now to find help. Uh, there's people that want to eat out and there's restaurants who just don't have the, the service available. As some of those benefits decrease, probably the normal human aspects will be people got to go back to work and they'll get a job now with increased levels of uh, minimum pay. Uh, might be more advantageous to generate an income again by way of a job, thereby still spend that money, um, maybe even the same amount as the benefits as they were receiving. So tough to tell right now because it's uh, such a, uh, a dynamic period coming off of the tremendous amount of federal money that uh, that had been approved and, and pushed out. And I think the last one that, uh, that I saw there to go ahead and publish, please offer more of these update webinars more frequently throughout the year if possible. We, uh, Brett and I have done this the last few quarters, Denise Overham and Brett before then. We are absolutely so pleased uh, and uh, thankful that you attended and uh, continue to attend our webinars and we're happy to push out as much information as possible. The reminder of course is that uh, we are looking at quarterly sales tax data. So our frequency there is probably still on a quarterly basis, but we uh, we are happy to continue these in the future and look forward to uh, being making uh, hopefully good relevant data available to you going forward. With that, I think that's the end of the questions. Um, if you have any other uh, questions, you want more information, please feel free, especially if you're a client, feel free to reach out to one of your uh, principal representatives on your team, those that meet with you on a quarter. We will be meeting with clients uh, starting in the, I think next week, uh, lasting all the way through the end of August. That'll be about the time where we get second quarter data. So uh, during the month of September, we'll start the whole cycle over again. But over these next couple of months, we'll be looking forward to, to seeing you uh, via video and talking through your results and what we think is to come. In the meantime, uh, thank you again so much for your time. I know Brett shares the same uh, same yeah. sentiments. Uh, hopefully everybody is uh, happy and ready to start your summer period, especially if you went through a tough budget cycle. Uh, take a load off, <laughs> try to relax and, uh, and get ready to do it again. Um, in the meantime, look forward to seeing you and talk to you very soon. Thanks so much.